Over the last week, the Commission has found himself under extraordinary pressure from the government to request that the then Home Secretary ban the march that was planned for Remembrance Day. The then Home Secretary ramped up that pressure with a controversial article in The Times where she suggested that senior officers play favourites when it comes to protesters. So Mark was called in to see the Prime Minister, which is why this event was rescheduled from last week. Well, the march went ahead and Suella Braverman is now out of a job, uh, though we may not have heard the last of her this year. At this event at the Institute for Government, Sir Mark's going to set out how he intends to achieve change in the Met. He's going to touch on some of the immediate challenges facing the force, and I'm sure he's also going to reflect on the events of the last week. And just before I hand over to you, Sir Mark, it's worth saying that we're going to, I know there's going to be lots of questions today. We've got press in the room. I know the audience have lots of questions, both in person and online. And um, so I'll leave about half the event for that. For those of you who are joining us online, you can submit questions anytime from now using Slido. So please do start sending them in. Sir Mark, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Again, sorry this event is a, a week delayed, but um, that's the nature of policing sometimes. It's fairly unpredictable, unpredictable business. Um, we set out sort of six months ago um, when we were building up to publishing our sort of reform plan for London, a plan called the New Met for London. Um, we wanted to do sort of two or three events with think tanks, and we set up this one to be focused, as you say, on, on high standards. Um, our, I see our mission has been about reinventing policing by consent for the 21st century. Policing by consent is our heritage and history. Um, the principles of it were written down by Sir Robert Peel and the first commissioners nearly 200 years ago. London's very different today, but the vision and the mission ought to be the same. And clearly in a contentious world and an organisation which has obviously made some ghastly errors, uh, that is a harder mission to achieve. But that has to be the, that has to be the ambition. And we've set out that we want to build more trust, less crime and high standards. Um, and it's the high standards theme obviously we're going to reflect on today. It's odd not to, it'd be odd not to reflect on sort of recent events. I think sort of starting more widely, we have one of the most challenging um, convergence of threats that I've ever seen. The convergence of sort of hostile state actors and you'll have heard colleagues talk about um, the amount of work to disrupt um, Iranian directed plots in the UK over the last year or so, overlaid with sort of the, the, the bubbling um, up of um, terrorism risks as a consequence of being inspired by the horrific attack by Hamas, um, overlaid with a surge in hate crime, community tensions, um, uh, contentious um, protests, all in a society which is ever more polarised and debates things ever more angularly on Twitter and elsewhere. That's a difficult operational context. Um, and it's also challenging for London to see certain communities in fear and upset and anxious about what's going on in the world and in London is obviously not where any of us, um, any of us want to be. Um, and in the middle of that, um, we must not only be um, impartial in our uh, uh, adherence to the law, but also we should be seen to do that. And I've been struck over the last sort of, um, over recent weeks, when um, Peel and commissioners wrote down the nine principles of policing, the fifth one, I think, captures the issues of the day. Um, to seek and preserve public favour, not by pandering to public opinion, but by constantly demonstrating absolutely impartial service to the law, in complete independence of policy, and without regard to the justice or injustice of the substance of individual laws. Um, it's interesting that that could have been written down nearly 200 years ago and be so um, apposite today. And the events of the last um, few weeks, I think, are a very high profile example of what officers do day in and day out. So whilst my decision making may be under sort of massive scrutiny, they are individually facing scrutiny day in and day out. Almost every event incident they deal with in public, they'll have tens of camera phones thrust in their faces as they're wrestling with an issue, perhaps resolving conflict and tension between neighbours, um, uh, dealing with um, conflict between groups in the street, um, stopping and searching people who they fear have, maybe have weapons on them. All the time they're wrestling with operating in that scrutiny and that public tension. And in the middle of that, say so we're talking about how do we deliver more trust, less crime, high standards. Um, 
within that plan, we have three themes of reform. One is about how we police and putting communities at the centre of our crime fighting and neighbour policing is something I've spoken about sort of passionately elsewhere and that has to be the foundation of what we do. Um, I've spoken about um, the foundations of the organisation, some of the challenges are some of our basic foundations in terms of training and equipment and the technology aren't where they need to be to be a successful organisation. Um, but today is more about the middle of those three, the, the, sort of the standards. Building a culture that is based around policing by consent. All of the public debates, understandably in the wake of Cousins and Carrick, focuses on what, what we are doing at the moment in terms of the biggest doubling down on standards in policing for 50 years. Um, it's, not, um, it's not a mission I relish as Commissioner, having to confront that and put standards on the top line, but it's necessary and we're doing that with vigour and the sort of the cases and the numbers that we've published in the uh, in recent weeks illustrate that but actually the culture of a healthy organization is much more than removing the individuals who shouldn't be there i've got tens of thousands of fantastic people who i and we need to collectively help succeed one of the reasons I returned to policing after sort of five years out in private and other sectors, the reason I realised I, I, I'm still in love with policing is the sort of passion that I see in officers. I worked with different organisations outside policing and people who are better trained, better equipped, better paid in lots of ways. I didn't anywhere find, find people who were so committed to the mission the sense of purpose that they've, that, they've joined, um, that they've joined with. And I see it day in and day out as they, um, they stretch themselves unreasonably in terms of the hours they work. In, I mean, at the moment, the amount of rest days we're cancelling still with all the just stop all protests in the week and then um, uh, Israel Gaz related protests at the weekend. Um, the dangers they put themselves under, I mean, 15 officers got assaulted confronting um, some of the problems at the weekend all of that and they do it with um, immense, immense good humour. Um, I was at our public order training centre where they're sort of training with I know, riot techniques and sort of looking at, I know, getting petrol bombs thrown at themselves and all the rest of it yesterday. And just chatting to officers there, it just comes across every conversation you have, that, that sense of commitment. Um, but something that struck me and is part of that uh, sort of point about standards and it's interesting for me how much Louise Casey pulled out in her report as well, how much they often don't feel that they're set up to succeed. Um, and that's where I think success lies, is in how the majority are better equipped, trained and able to do it. And just to give you some examples, so training, um, we found that our recruit training hasn't been sufficiently practical, so our recruits haven't been sufficiently well set up and we've been changing that um, and that's starting to have, have some benefits. Um, issues of equipment, we'd fallen behind the um, issues, some equipment problems at the back there by the sound of it as well. Um, issues of equipment, um, we were one of the few forces in the country that hasn't issued phones to officers and we're now getting to a stage where every officer will soon hope to have a phone and a, and a laptop and so it's given the basic modern equipment which sounds obvious. We got into the habit of buying the cheapest uniform um, and that sounds trivial. Um, until you're stood on a crime scene cause and at three o'clock in the morning it's raining in February and you're wet and cold. Um, pay wasn't sort of sustainable in London. Um, grateful the government did the full recommendation of the pay review body this year for the 7% and we had £1,000 flexibility that we put on top of that which is um, helping. We start to see our recruitment start to turn the corner on the back of that and some other changes. Thinking about their role, we can't give people an undeliverable role um, and you'll have seen how sort of determinedly we've tried to move the dial on mental health issues that police officers aren't the right people to deal with and that came in a couple of weeks ago. Um, the right care, right person scheme that we've stolen with pride from Humberside, which is starting to get the right people dealing with those in mental health crisis rather than police officers. But from a police officer perspective, it gives them more time to do what they're trained to do and makes their jobs more manageable. The same as we're putting more resources into um, dealing with the victims of rape and sexual assault because that area has is struggled under the weight of demand. And we're strengthening leadership, which I know is something you want to talk about. So um, the level of leadership training in policing 
has been um, cut back progressively over 20 or 30 years um, to a point, and the comparison I make here just to illustrate, illustrate this, if you compare a chief superintendent with a colonel in the army, um, they will both be leading sort of maybe 1,000 or 2,000 people. Um, a colonel in the army since Sandhurst will have had 72 weeks leadership training in that maybe 15 years or so. Um, the chief superintendents who work, um, work in the Met, since being an inspector, if they've had two or three weeks training, they're lucky. Um, and that's the sort of, that's the, I mean, it's, it's a crazy distinction. So we, we're, we're tackling all of those issues. There's an awful lot more to do. But if culture is about how things are done around here, then you need to change all of those basics to, to work with the positive spirit that we have in the majority of the organisation whilst dealing with those who shouldn't be here. I can build success with the talent we have in the organisation, but we do need the support of others. There are, there are factors outside of my control, such as the sort of criminal justice system and the, and the challenges there, the funding of policing, um, and a particular example recently, I think it's excellent the Home, Home Office are doing this review of police accountability. Um, because officers confronting violent and dangerous people are increasingly more concerned about what will follow than they are the dangerous person they're facing, and that can't be right. And of course there needs to be scrutiny and accountability, but officers need to feel it's gonna be swift and fair rather than sort of very long and uncertain. So I'm determined we're gonna set them up to succeed, and the standards and culture agenda is about uh, is, is about the principle of policing by consent and bring to the fore the good values they have, whilst at the same time dealing with the very eminent, uh, evident problems that people have, have, have highlighted. And one of the reasons for talking about these sort of issues here is it starts to illustrate there's much that we need to do, but there's wider support and help that we need from others, and maybe that will come out in some of the conversation. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you, Mark. I want to talk initially about the events of the last week and then we move on to some of the broader issues around kind of culture and standards and so on. And um, last week, you know, we were supposed to run this event as discussed, but you were called in to see the Prime Minister and Home Secretary after saying that you wouldn't be asking for a ban on the march. Now your decision, as you, as you said, was based on an operational assessment of the situation. The police are not there to pander to public opinion, as, as you've put it. The Home Secretary and the Prime Minister who were urging a ban were coming from a more political perspective value, symbolism, and so on. And the language got really tense, the Home Secretary using the term hate march, uh, accusing officers of playing favourites. Did the then Home Secretary make the job of your officers harder at the weekend? And did she make it harder for you as Commissioner to exercise the operational independence that is so important to the Met? I, I'm, I'm not going to get into a long conversation, sort of going to try and go back over the sort of whys and wherefores um, of the last week. The way police accountability is constructed is I have accountabilities in different ways to the Home Secretary and to the Mayor and um, sometimes there'll be robust conversations and that's sort of I think that's probably what Parliament expected um, they have their roles as politicians thinking on behalf of the public and their constituencies and I have my role um, uh, with a sort of a third accountability which goes to the law mm -hmm. and that was the sort of that was the exchanges taking place last week, and there's not much more to say about it. Thank you. So some of the decisions that you've had to make over the last week, though, I think do get to the heart of attention for the Met, that you're London's police force, but you're also a force with national responsibilities. As you said, you know, communities are at the centre of your work, but you're a national force too. Um, did the public disagreements over the march highlight how sometimes that national role can interfere with your London role? Can that national role get in the way of the kind of community level and neighbourhood level policing that you need to put at the heart of the Met? I don't, I don't think they're separate. I think they're, I think they're sort of opposite sides of the same coin. London is such an extraordinary city. And we're in a, um, if you think it's, if you compare us to America, London is the political capital, mm -hmm. like Washington. London's a financial centre like New York. London's um, a sort of technology centre like, uh, I don't know, sort of San Francisco or whatever. London's a cultural centre like LA. We have such a sort of extraordinary city. It is bound to have national interest from national politicians as well as communities and the, sort of the, the nine plus million people who live here. So 
I think what, however you think about London and policing governance, there's always going to be a local politicians interested in it, and there's always going to be national politicians interested in it, and that's, that's the nature of it. So I don't, I don't think that's a problem. I think that's, that's the strength of London, because um, London's got so many sort of, so many citizens, so many residents here who come from all over the world to, for, for, for employment, to the, to the city or other roles, um, and that sort of, that complexity and that being a global city is part of it. Um, and so I think the sort of, however you design policing, whoever sat in my chair or one like it, will be talking to a mayor and a home secretary, it's bound to happen. Thank you. So, as you said, we don't want to just talk about the protests today. I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions on that from the audience. We're also here to talk about the turnaround plan and higher standards in particular. It's an ambitious plan, as you've said, and I think you said you think you can turn around the force in two years by 2025. I think just last week, actually, just before everything kind of kicked off, we saw it reported that a Met detective had been allowed to keep her job with only a written warning after being found guilty of gross misconduct for sending racist messages to a colleague. Now, I know you won't want to focus on an individual case, understandably, but these cases do seem to, to keep coming. Are you still confident that you can turn around the Met um, according to the timeline that you've set out so in we, that plan? Over, we've, we've put a two-year plan out and we'll make massive progress in that time. I mean, no organisation is ever perfect, so sort of, you can't draw a sort of false line, say we're, we're not perfect today and we're perfect on that date, but we will make a, a massive amount of progress over those, over those two years. And a part of it is I mean, we published a report on the policing board, when was that, um, three or four weeks ago, which was talking about the progress on the narrow issue of standards in respect of removing officers, more investigations, more suspensions, et cetera, and the data there is very compelling, and we talked about how that would be going up further over the next year. It does illustrate what you might call um, a paradox, mm -hmm. the, the sorting out of the sort of minority in the organisation who shouldn't be there, potentially brings more bad news, but that, that's what we must do to build trust, yet potentially it builds more bad news. And, that's, um, and I talk regularly about that when I talk with media and do other interviews because people want to see that we're sorting those issues out. Um, and I think that is starting to be recognised. But as I said earlier, I think sort of the culture of an organisation's success, that's, that's a small part of it getting rid of a, maybe a cancer out of the body. It's about the healthy body. And I say, I've got these fantastic people who don't always feel equipped and set up to succeed in the way they need. So for um, Londoners watching this event today, what will they see in two years' time if you've been successful? What will, how will their experience of the Met be different? Um, and what, how, will they know, how will they know it's worked? Okay. So, so um, some, of the, some of the ways that... A lot of this is sort of like behind the scenes, changing an organisation to be effective. The impact for the public, though... So um, we've talked about community crime fighting. So a style of policing that is, is built around how police and communities tackle issues together rather than police imposing solutions on communities. You'll see in the plan that we've put um, uh, sort of strengthening neighbourhood policing at the centre of it. Um, over a, a decade, our neighbourhood policing in not just London but across the UK has got, got weaker. And that's where that foundation of relationships between officers who know their patch and know the communities and understand the issues that are worrying people in a way that doesn't always come through in crime statistics and are then able to work with them and partner agencies to tackle them. It's absolutely critical. Um, at the moment, we've, we've sort of, we're about uh, 1,600 police and community support officers fewer than we had a decade ago. Um, that's a big capacity in, in, in neighbourhoods alongside the, the, the police officers who work there. And we've started building that number um, and that number's going to sort of grow by sort of maybe a couple of hundred this year. Um, but I, I, my intent would be to sort of grow that all the way forward. I know the mayor's very keen on, uh, on PCSOs as well. So strengthening neighbourhood policing so you have a, a more local presence that's dealing with issues that you can see. Um, a, a second particularly big issue, how we deal with um, uh, male predatory violence against women and children. Um, it's an area that um, we've been rightly criticised in some respects. Um, it's an under-resourced area. As, as, as confidence to report these issues has grown over a decade and offences like rape and domestic violence have sort of tripled or quadrupled in the amount they've been reported, which is both fantastic that it's coming forward, mm -hmm. um, but the resources and the capacity to deal with that hasn't moved at that pace and that creates stretch services which sometimes lets down victims, which is, which is tragic at a particularly difficult um, moment in their lives. And we now have a a slower criminal justice system that is making that harder. Um, 
but I know the new DPP has this really firmly in his mind about trying to improve some of these issues. Uh, so we're putting more resources already, 565 people more into that area. Um, we're doing lots with training, adopting some different ways of investigating these crimes. And we're also testing how, rather than just reacting to these type of offences, can we use data and analytics to identify the most dangerous male predators in London and proactively go after them to protect people going forward. And that's already showing some early results. So those are some of the indications about how we're changing how we operate. I also want to talk about the Casey review. Um, you mentioned it in your opening, opening statement, the fact that culture change is about more than just removing individuals who shouldn't be there. Um, so in, in her review, Louise Casey found that the Met was institutionally misogynist, racist, homophobic, and I know that you accepted her diagnosis, um, Mark, and uh, apologise to the people of London. You did, though, I think, decline to use the term institutional, said that it had been politicised and that the term meant different things to different people. Now, I, I talked to a number of different organisations today to prepare for this event. Some of them were organisations that represent minoritised groups um, who sometimes have a difficult relationship with the Met, but I spoke also to lots of organisations that work closely with the Met, and actually all of them raised this issue of, of not wanting to own that term, kind of institutional, um, and all those people felt they did understand and recognise what it meant. So I suppose I'd, I'd really like to understand what does the term institutional mean to you and why don't you want to apply that to the Met, given, as you say, culture change is about more than just bad individuals? Uh, so um, we've gone around this loop, um, gone around this loop so many times. Um, one of the things that struck me over the people who've asked this question over the last six months, I think I've had three, four or five different definitions just from people asking me the question, which sort of illustrates the challenge. And interpretations of it range from um, nobody in the organisation is discriminatory, it's just your systems and policies, all the way through to everyone in the organisation is discriminatory. Now, you can look at Louise Casey came up with the definition, there's obviously the McPherson definition, there's different definitions in the dictionary. Um, I need to use plain language. I have accepted um, the diagnosis in the report. We have systemic failings that have contributed to the sort of discrimination in the organisation and those have to be rooted out and tackled. Um, but I'm not going to use a label that means so many things to different people, particularly when to some people it suggests that everyone in the organisation is of that view, because that's definitely not the case. Thank you. I also want to talk a little bit about the mechanics of, of reform. I think part of the problem, part of the plan, sorry, is making sure that the right people are police officers and that those who aren't fit to be police officers, like my cousins, don't make it in in the first place. And I know that improved vetting is a big part of the turnaround plan. Now, in the last, I think, four years, more than 45,000 new officers have been recruited across the country to meet the government's um, uplift target. I know the police inspectorate have found that vetting units have struggled to cope with you know, such a high caseload. So are you confident that new recruits to the Met have been thoroughly vetted? So we are, um, we're putting more resources into vetting, we're changing our processes, we're doing more, for example, with things like social media, um, looking deep into people's social media history and those sorts of issues. So we're constantly strengthening it and also changing the decision making. Um, there's been some new national guidance in terms of how you make decisions that we've brought in. Um, and um, I think a big factor is the sort of work that um, uh, government is doing on sort of a police regulations review, which published a few months ago and they're finalising the implementation of those changes because there are some fundamental regulatory changes which undermine this system as well. Probably not everybody in the room or, or sort of watching um, online would know this, but police officers aren't under normal employment law in most respects. They're under something called police regulations. Um, and regards to the rights and wrongs of that, they're fairly convoluted. One example of a weakness which has been around for decades and previous commissioners have challenged it and previous governments haven't tackled it, but this government is, is the fact that there is no explicit way in regulations to remove somebody who fails a revetting process which is clearly nonsensical, um, but the absence of that provision has made revetting sort of, in some respects, sort of weaker because, well, what do I do with this person? I should probably fail their revetting, but I don't know what we do with them then, so we'll just put some conditions on them and they can't do certain types of work. Now, um, uh, we're trying to find ways with existing regulations to deal with that, but it needs a sort of clear and explicit change, which the government is committed to, which is fantastic. So there's a lot we can do in terms of our training and decision making, and there's things, just to illustrate my point earlier, others can do to help us, 
by tightening the rules so that we can work through the people. And we've got a long list of people we've identified who, and we're working through that revetting process um, because of the intelligence we have behind them. Thank you, Mark. OK, we're about halfway through, and I know we've got lots of questions from the audience, so I'm going to come first to a set of press questions. So I've got Ivor Bennett from Sky. Ivor? Hi, Ivor. Hi, hi there. Mark. Sorry, microphone yeah. coming around. Sure. Well, that was all very dynamic there, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, Ivor Bennett from Sky. Uh, first, I want to ask you about events last night uh, where pro-Palestinian demonstrators climbed on a war memorial at Hyde Park Corner. Officers were there and no arrests were made. Some might say those events uh, prove the point the old Home Secretary was making, um, that the Met is guilty of playing favourites with some protesters. What would you say to that? And secondly, the new Home Secretary this morning has suggested that you might need more powers to stop this happening again. What do you think? Thanks. So, um I've said very explicitly, I'm not going to get into the politics of this, and you've asked me a question about the politics of it, so I'm not going to answer most of it. Um, the explicit things about um, last night, it is, it is not illegal to climb onto a statue. I think that might be something that um, government may, may consider, um, but that's for them to decide, not for me. Um, the officer recognised that whilst it wasn't illegal, it was sort of, um, it, it was unfortunately inflammatory in certain ways. The officers at the scene asked them to get down and they did. So the officers intervened, as, as officers often are doing, to try and de-escalate risk of conflict, even when there is an explicit power to do it. So I think they did a sensible thing. But of course you get photos and people like you sort of banding them around saying, what should the police do about this? That's the nature of policing, it's contentious. But um, what the officer didn't do last night is make up a law that it's illegal to do something and do, a, do an arrest, which would have been illegal, clearly. But what about the second point that the new Home Secretary is making, um, that your powers are under review and maybe they need to be strengthened? Do you think you have sufficient powers to conduct public order policing correct? I'm not going to get into a long conversation about that. There's, there's lots of ideas about things that um, could change. I think there are, there are some practical provisions in the current public order powers which, um, in our view, don't work very well. Um, and we'll talk about those with government. There are other issues which are much more profound issues about the balance between the rights of some people to protest and the impact on others. That's not an issue for policing, that's an issue for parliament and democracy to work out where that balance is. Which okay, I've got, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go to another question. Which don't, don't work very well at the moment? Uh, I'm not going to talk about those issues in detail today. We're discussing with government those issues and I think now's the wrong time to sort of describe it publicly. Okay, I've got George from the Mail. George. I was also going to ask that about that event, but while I have you, um, Yvette, Yvette Cooper uh, today warned of a, a spiral of disrespect between ministers and police if we see sort of similar rhetoric that we've seen over the last few weeks. I mean, how, how do you feel about that? Is that a, a realistic possibility? And does the rhetoric from senior politicians need to change? I know what my job is, and I'm cracking on with it. Okay. Aubrey from The Times. Uh, good morning, Sir Mark. Um, Yesterday, there was a significant legal ruling, and the response of the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party was to suggest that people should ignore the laws. Is it acceptable for a politician to advocate ignoring the law? Politicians hold me to account. I don't hold them to account. It's not acceptable to ignore the law. I've answered the question. Okay. Jacob Phillips from PA. Jacob. Hi, sir, Mark. I just wanted to ask you, if you're having to advise police officers when there's all this pressure coming from politicians, what, what do, you, do you say anything differently to them when there's articles in the Times or, or those comments made? Is it interfering with policing? So what officers are... Officers are used to contention and noise around what they do. I explained that earlier in terms of sort of... They turn up at the scene and there's different views. They're dealing with maybe friction between two neighbours or something like that and they've got and, and they're in the street and there's camera phones in their faces they're used to contention it's what they deal with all the time they're just very committed to they're very practical committed people they get on with their job and they, they don't um, they don't worry unduly about those issues and I don't encourage them to either okay I want to take some questions from the audience now yeah as I thought lots of hands up can I ask you please to wait for the microphone 
uh, tell us your name, your organisation, and given that we do have lots of interest today, please can you ask short questions rather than give comments. We're going to I'll take one here, one here, and one there. Uh, thank you. I'm James Sweetland. I'm a contributing writer at Policing Insight. I, I was struck by your comments about technology in the Met there, so that you've not as yet got mobile phones out to all staff. No, we've done that now, but sort of we, we're doing okay. laptops now, yeah. Sure, but we know that policing is very keen to make the most of AI, new technology, all these kinds of things. So maybe looking at, in a decade's time, what is your aspiration for what police officers in the Met should be doing with AI and new tech? And perhaps more importantly, what should they no longer be doing because those functions have been automated and saved time? Um, we're just going to take a chance so, three. So, sorry, Mark. We're so we'll take two or three, sorry, okay. Exactly. Yep. Hi, my name is Julie Redmond. I'm the GLA candidate for Barnet and Camden in the Maryland election next May. Um, I'm here today because, firstly, I just want to say um, a huge thank you to everything you've done over the last couple of weeks and everything your force is doing. I know how hard you're working and my background is nursing and I've worked in A&E and I've worked alongside the police yes. for many, many years. So... Um, if I was to get elected in May, what I would like to ask you is, I want to look at something completely different from the marches and everything that's going on at the moment, but looking at homelessness and also uh, drugs on our streets. And obviously we have a lot of that around Camden. Do you and the Met Police work alongside the nursing teams and the mental health teams in the areas? And um, if not, is that something you would actually think about implementing? Because I think actually working as a multidisciplinary team alongside the different nursing and medical teams would be a really good idea going forward. Thank you. Thank you. And then we've got one more here. I, uh, Andrew Smith, I'm a London resident, I guess, this is my only claim. Um, you talked about changing culture and uh, improving standards, and, but the Met is twice the size of Police Scotland, four times the size of any other um, English police service. Is that really practical in uh, an organisation this size? And if you, you know, some commentators have suggested moving out uh, national policing roles, and some have suggested geographical splits. If you thought that was a sensible approach, would you be able to say so, or are you limited in, in your role as to what you can say on that respect? Thank you. So we've got um, tech, homelessness and drugs, um, use of multidisciplinary teams, and then the size of the Met, and whether that you yeah. know, raises bigger questions for the way that the Met needs to yeah. be reformed. Um, so I'll do, do in the reverse order. The last, so London's a big city, so it's going to have a big police force. And I, I, I think if you chop it up, the consequences are you spend more time on boundary management than you do on anything else. So I, I, I think it's... Uh, I, I would be very happy to say it if I thought it was the right answer. Um, but as long, as long as London's this big and complicated, then I think it's natural that you have a big police force in it. And it's not more complicated than that. In terms of... That deals with the geographic issue. In terms of the, the national functions, um, I know it can look strange on a sort of, from the outside, of, well, why does the Met lead counter-terrorism functions nationally, for example? Um, sort of for most of the sort of recent decades, um, more than half the people of concern on sort of terrorist lists live in London. Most terrorist attacks take place in London. Um, they're sort of the tactics to, de to deal with terrorism, a lot of it depends on communities and there's a link between community policing and counter-terrorism policing in terms of, um, in terms of intelligence and, safeguard and spotting vulnerable individuals and all those issues. So there's such a link across them, even though it adds to the size of the organisation, it's the right solution. If we separated it out, what we would see is more risk to the public because of the, the things that would fall through those cracks. So it's absolutely the right answer. Going back to what I said earlier about the UK being a, a country which is very centred on London in lots of ways. That's why I think it makes sense in this context. It does create a big organisation which has its challenges, um, but I think it's the right um, answer. In terms of the partnership question, and um, I, I can't answer the specifics of what's going on there at the moment, but I, I, I think fundamentally policing has to, to succeed, has to be a partnership organisation. The point I was making about community crime fighting um, the tactics that police bring are normally sort of 
problem solving, enforcement, sort of suppress, they're, they're more suppressive. The long term solutions to that sometimes sit under crime problems, which may be about, um, about issues such as sort of um, mental health, about sort of substance, alcohol abuse, etc., all of those issues, those are clearly never going to be our specialism. So um, that you, need the com you need the combination. And I think the sort of crime disorder partnerships with local authorities and health services and others are, are critical at the local level just like more wide, the criminal justice partnership. So the, sort of the broad principle completely, um, completely agree with you. And there's, there are many examples of taking um, offenders who have a, um, are prolific offenders, but are driven by a drugs habit. There are many examples where sort of drugs and other interventions can help um, deal with that problem to most effect. Um, and then technology, uh, yeah, the guy there. Um, so, I think in terms of streamlining our systems, we have a lot of quite pay, um, mandrolic processes where um, AI has massive potential to streamline all the, all the research and record keeping. We do. Just looking at a vetting process would be a good example. There's lots of separate checks being done. Um, uh, we're looking at how you can sort of automate that and bring AI so you can do most of the heavy lifting can be done automatically and then you might have a human decision on the, on the end of it. Um, in terms of what it looks, how it looks different to the public. I think a couple of examples of things I would like to see, um, how we can better identify the most dangerous offenders. We have massive amounts of data. The thing about policing is, the thing that makes policing achievable is that it's a small number of people who commit most crime. It's a small number of victims who suffer most crime. And it's a small number of locations that experience most crime. Um, Classic analysis helps you identify those cases. AI has massive potential through big data to make us more precise. Precision is a key word for me, make us more precise so we use our limited resources to best effect at identify, uh, tackling you know, the most dangerous individuals or, the, or supporting the most, the most vulnerable. Thank you. Okay, another round of questions. Got one here, uh, one here, one here. Thanks. I don't think I need a, a mic because I've got a loud enough voice. Yeah, for, <laughs> right. okay. all right. uh, first of all, thank you, Sir Mark, for being here today. I think uh, I'm very fond of uh, how you've started your job. I've worked with nearly every commissioner since John Stevens. I did a numerous programs with the Blue Sky Network at Scotland Yard on diversity. Yeah. I helped to set up the ambassador in the community program okay. in 2000 with Lord Stevens. And it was great to see you at the memorial service recently with my three friends, which I've been attending for many years. Um, now, my, I believe in common sense. Common sense should be something that we should all live, by, uh, live our lives by, whether we are politicians or police officers. Common sense is the key. And I also believe in holistic approach to policing as well, where the community stand with the police. I mean, I'm a great fan of the Met because the Met saved my life when I was stabbed 11 times when I was 16. Wow. So were it not for the Met, I wouldn't be here talking now and making a nuisance of myself. But I'd just like to say my question is this. I do believe in holistic uh, approach to and common sense approach to uh, policing. But oh, I worked with John Stevens back then to help to make the police service much more diverse because I believe that the police service should reflect the community that is policing. So what is your kind of plans to make uh, the police service much more diverse? So, thank you. So, um, I'm, I'm, glad you're, I'm glad we saved your life so you can ask me difficult questions. That's, that, 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 that's, that's, um, that's great. Um, so, I think there's two reasons to become more diverse and you only sort of reflected one of them. I think sort of reflecting society, the police is critical. But I also, from my time outside policing and thinking about it from a business perspective, I think we also need to recognise all the evidence that the most successful organisations are diverse because it brings different skills, different, different, um, it brings a different lens to a problem. Um, and sort of the more monocultural you are as an organisation, the more likely you are to be knocked over by a surprise. So it's not just a social justice purpose, it's a, we'll be the best we can be if we're, if we're diverse. Um, the Met has moved on a long way in diversity in the last 20 years, but we still have a, a long way to go and sort of, London accelerates so fast, we struggle to keep up with it candidly. I mean, we're, I think these numbers are approximate, but I think we're, we're now recruiting um, on gender, it's sort of, Getting there, we're recruiting about 40% of 
um, about 40% women, um, and our, our total numbers, I think, tip past 30%. Um, it's clearly not where you want it to be. Um, and on sort of um, uh, black, Asian, and other sort of minority heritage groups, we're um, recruiting around 25, 30%. Um, London's 40%, I know. But so, so uh, but it, they are pretty healthy numbers, but not as good as they need to be. Um, we are doing all sorts of outreach schemes and different ways of encouraging different groups to, to join. And then a key sort of metric, isn't it, is about do people see they've got equal chance within the organisation? Um, so we track issues such as our promotion processes. So is the diversity of the successful candidates for a promotion process sort of, is it at least as good as the eligible pool? And um, in pretty much every process I've seen in the last year, we, that has been the case. But so tracking that through is absolutely critical. So completely committed to it for the reasons you articulate and more. Thank you. I'm going to take a couple of questions now. So I've got one here, one here, and then one at the back. One here, one here. these two here. Hi, I'm um, Donald Fernandez from Hounslow Council. You mentioned about the local partnerships. Yeah. So I work with uh, the Community Safety Partnership and also with Children's Services, and I'm involved with how the police interface with um, local organisations. And the experience is that the police can be quite insular, like they, they, you have the, the boards where you meet and you have conversations. But when it comes to operational matters, there's, the police are great. I mean, the people I've met are very committed, very de dedicated, as you say. But there, there's a, a missing link, and I think the police are missing out on tapping into those resources. So my question is, how do you see the culture of that joint working changing over the next few years? Yeah. Thank you, and so, I've got... I'm sorry, computer, yes, right. sorry. Penelope Gibbs from Transform Justice. One of the most successful bits of policing is a very hidden one, which is police resolving crime out of court, using cautions and other things. But politicians and media use charging and prosecution as the only success metric for the police. How can we get politicians and the media to recognize the success involved in police resolving crime out of court? Yeah. Thank you. And then one at the back over there. Thank you. Um, Emily Wells, I'm from the Centre for Social Justice, but I am an ex-police officer uh, from Manchester. Um, thank you for what you said, Mar Ursa Mark. Um, I, you mentioned right care, right person. Um, and I just wanted to ask about how much success you might have seen with that. Um, and if not, what are the next steps in dealing with mental health for police officers? Okay. Super. Mental Great, health, thank you. Out of court and joint yeah. working culture. So, we've, um, as, at the centre of our work on values, we've listed sort of five principles about how we're going to operate. And one of them is about being collaborative, because I don't think we're always collaborative as we should do. Um, you'll have seen we've put a, a senior officer to a borough level now, superintendents, to, to start to, to provide that sort of coalescence point. Um, I do think crime disorder partnerships have got weaker um, over recent years. Um, I think some of that is about our weakening neighbour policing and other factors that are down to us. Some of it, local authorities have reduced resources in that, that environment as well. So I think, I think we have, if we're candid, we have pulled apart a bit. Um, and I, I'm determined we will do our bit to try and strengthen that because um, we are more successful when we work together because we have, different, we have different tools to apply alongside each other to particular problems in communities around, around crime and disorder. So that's absolutely, um, absolutely our intent. I completely, out of court disposals, where's the lady on that? That was, the, sorry. Um, out of court disposals, I completely um, agree with you. I think there's sort of, the fundamental test for me is, does it, does it feel to the people involved with it, it's been solved? And does it make sense to the victim? And sometimes you can achieve those ends without the full rigmarole of the criminal justice system. Absolutely agree. Um, I was, when I was Chief Constable of Surrey, sort of a, more than a decade ago now, I, sort of, I was involved in sort of pushing this very hard. So it was then called community resolutions to try and sort of widen what was available to sort of solve, um, solve cases pragmatically. Not least because I saw then to chase sort of detection targets 
officers were making arrests in cases where discretion would have made more sense for a more pragmatic solution. A sort of a modern equivalent of a clip round the ear, so to speak, but, but without, without the clip, clearly. Um, there's now a new framework coming to legislation called out-of-court disposals, which starts to, um, starts to give a, an opportunity for it. Um, there is some detailed work being done on what, it, what actually counts and is a success, and that's really important if you're going to get the right incentives in the system. And um, we've just recently signed off sort of our plans um, at Management Board about how we're going to put plenty of resources into that end of it so that our officers have got the right support to, to, to use that as widely as possible. Um, so I think the out-of-court disposals has a role um, where it makes sense for the victim. Um, I think, and I think it, it's as it often does. Um, we are already seeing on, so the right care, right person, the, the volumes of time that police officers are spending on mental health cases is, is awful. It also sometimes leads to criminalizing people in mental health crisis unnecessarily. Um, and um, it's not putting the right skills and, around that person at that, that awful moment. So it's been in for us now, I think, two, two weeks or so. Um, it's already reducing our deployments by hundreds of cases a day. So it's had an immediate benefit overnight. Um, some parts of it will take a bit longer to kick in, but we are seeing the benefit. And the, the officers I was talking to in the margins of their riot training yesterday were off local response teams. And they were and, and sort of without me asking the question, they volunteer or, that they're already seeing a difference from it. So it makes quite a, it, making quite a big difference which means they can get on with what they're skilled to do and not feel they're trying to deal with something which, is, which they're not adequately trained for. Thank you. Okay, a couple more questions. Yeah, but one here, uh, <coughs> one here, and one here. Uh, Mark, Nick Campsey from the London Policing Board. Congratulations to you and your colleagues on navigating the last week. Um, it seems to me that there's an elephant in the room um, Crime is increasing in complexity. We're seeing increased reporting of crime, which is obviously a good thing, and the pressures on you to achieve and enforce are ever-growing. But at the same time, over the last 10 years or so, I think your budget is either flat or slightly down in real terms. So, no, it's much worse than that. OK. Char 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 charitably, then. So does there just need to be an honest conversation between yourself and the purse string holders as to either a commensurate increase in funding or realism about the scope of what the Met Police actually can achieve within its funding envelope? Thank you. Uh, Jonathan Wren, actor. Crown Series 6 starts today. <laughs> um, right. Having, good, plug. Yeah, good, plug, well good plug. Having just taken part in a two weeks jury service, at the Inner London Crown Court, Elephant and Castle, I was appalled to witness two police officers lie under oath. Fabricated evidence against the defendant was obvious, as was their contempt for the law. Perjury had been committed. The black defendant had waited three years to come to court and was not guilty. Is this a frightening indication that systemic racism is rife within the police force? Thank you. I think I have one at the back there. Hi, Jack Herford from Big Brother Watch. Um, so, Mark, you put a lot of emphasis on accountability and standards. What's your view that your force retains a vast number of custody images that are held unlawfully as per the High Court ruling in 2012? And the, um, what's your view that your force is enrolling these in mass surveillance facial recognition systems rather than dedicating resource to ensuring that these photo, unlawfully held photos are deleted by the Met? Um, Thank you. I'm not going to deal with that last one simply, be, um, simply because there's a lot of technical reasons behind it and I know there's been correspondence and stuff on the subject. So I'd rather leave it to that correspondence. And if you want to write in, we can respond in detail on the, on the, sort of, on the issues um, behind that. Um, in terms of that specific case, um, I know nothing clearly about, about that case. Um, I'm sure if the judge feels the evidence was that officers were dishonest, um, he or she will, um, will write to us. Um, 
Uh, if you want to let so maybe my colleagues know the, the details of the case afterwards, then we can follow up and look at that ourselves as much as we're able to without the judge's intervention. Um, and I think I dealt with the sort of the issues about standards and discrimination earlier. We do have officers who need sorting out, and that's what we're that's what we're doing. In terms of um, uh, Nick's question about money, so to, for us to be spending the same amount of money on policing London today as we were a decade ago head of population in real terms um, would need a 26% uplift, which is £868 million. Um, that's, a, that's a big, so if you just take head of population as a benchmark, that's, that's a, big, um, a big deficit. Um, and some types of crime have gone down, but more complex crimes have got greater reporting, like cybercrime or like um, violence against women and girls that we spoke about, spoke about earlier. Um, I'm sure it's something in the context of the policing board we will be discussing and the sort of budget work we're doing um, at the moment that we're sort of making our submissions to government and, and, um, and City Hall sort of reflect the scale of the challenges and our, our view on how to go into that. Um, and I think it does... It does... Um, it is, a, it is a factor in some of the struggles of the organisation, and I, I'm definitely not going to sort of say this is everyone else's fault. Clearly, we must own a lot of the issues. Um, but we have an organisation that's foundations are particularly damaged because there's been a pressure to sustain um, officer numbers, and we all want to do that, and I wanted to do that myself. Um, and everyone always looks to sort of the back office and for, for savings first. Um, and again, I don't... I think that's a necessarily a bad idea, but you can end up in a situation where your HR and your training and your technology and all the things that I've touched on earlier in terms of officers feeling set up to succeed get weakened. And sort of there's a point when sensible savings become um, uh, sort of excessive and undermine capability. So some of this is about frontline capacity and capability. Some of it is about the sort of foundations of the organisation. We'll be playing those out in our in our budget conversations, um, budget conversations going forward. But that sort of a quarter less in real terms for the population is a big challenge in such a complex city. Thank you, Mark. And then I want to. We've got about five minutes left. I just want to end on some questions that have been sent in to us. Okay. So, what role should the College of Policing play in ensuring that the pipeline of officers um, have the kind of character, behaviours, skills that you need um, and expect in the Met? We've recently heard that police shouldn't fear ending up in the dock. Does that mean external structures for accountability should be necessary for policing by consent? And then last, I think it's right that at every stage of the criminal justice system, there are a disproportionate number of people from minoritized communities. How in practice can the Mets go about rebuilding trust um, with those groups, with those people? I get to the end of these sessions and my memory fades. So that was the first two questions. So the first one was College of Policing. Yeah, okay. Um, what role should it play yeah. in ensuring the right character, the right behaviours? Then um, should there be external accountability structures, given the comment around police not, shouldn't fear okay, ending up in a yeah, Okay, got it. Yeah, um, okay. So um, in terms of sort of disproportionality in all sort of parts of systems, it is, it is really complex, isn't it? And there's people who spend forever studying these subjects and are the causes structural issues, are they organisational bias, are they individual bias and there's all sorts of different factors that play in those and I'm not going to try and um, expand across those and I clearly when it comes to policing um, there are sort of different, two different sets of measures, there are measures around how we police and how force and various tactics are used um, and and sometimes there is disproportionality in those. Um, and, but the other factor is also communities' experience of crime, and communities experience crime um, at different rates, which is also something that we have to counter because everyone should have an equal experience. And, and the sort of the one that the number that worries me most in, most in this is that um, in the last decade, young black men grow, growing up in London are 13 times more likely to be murdered than young white men. Um, that's a horrific. Uh, that's a horrific fact. Um, so we've got things we need to do better and say rooting out some people who shouldn't be in the organisation is part of it. But there are also wider complex society issues that aren't all, um, aren't all in our, in our um, gift. Um, the College of Policing, um, 
they are critical. So they've been looking at standards of training that link into um, link into um, recruiting and also particularly, so as I said earlier, reviewing the vetting standards and, and the decision making processes and accrediting how that starting to accredit how that works. So that's that's critical to them as a standard setting and sort of sharing best practice. Um, and then in terms of external accountability, the, the police accountability view, review that the Home Office is doing is absolutely critical as I touched on earlier. Mm -hmm. um, it deeply worries me that I talk to sort of good, enthusiastic, determined frontline officers and they're more worried about what follows a dangerous situation than they are actually about a dangerous situation um, because they see colleagues who get tied in knots over three different legal tests that get applied by three different processes that can take five, eight, ten years. Um, and that's, that's, not fair on, uh, that's not fair on them, that's not fair on others involved. Um, we all need a system which is um, fair and practical and speedy and um, officers who go way, way beyond anything that's sensible need to be dealt with um, robustly. Um, but officers who are working to their training and making decisions in split, se in split seconds, um, if they get something slightly wrong under that pressure, there has to be a pragmatic way of dealing with it if we're not going to discourage anybody from wanting to do that job. Thank you. OK, we're at midday, so I'm going to have to draw the event to a close. So, Mark, thank you so much thank you for very taking much. the time to attend today. Thank you very much for the audience, too.